and we're live. So hi Tim, how are you doing? It's a good day today so far, thank you. Fantastic, well welcome to the Sky Shy Travel Guide Live, how to thank travel. You. And uh, we're excited to have you, um, so introduce yourself to our um, audience. Uh, my name is Anderson from Marginal Boundaries. Uh, we are an immersion travel blog, but apart from that, I am a keynote presenter and speaker. Uh, most recently, I was at TBEX uh, in Cancun, Mexico, speaking on advanced Facebook marketing. Um, and we basically travel as well as focus on social media and marketing solutions um, for businesses and brands around the world. That's kind of our thing. Right now we're still in, we've been in Mexico for about four years actually and we really like it down here so we're still working on the local level. There's a lot to see. That's that's the short version. I could go on for days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, well, thank you for the introduction. And um, so Tim, where are you in Mexico? Right now I'm about 45 minutes outside of Palenque. We're actually in a little small pueblo where Chris's family is from. She's actually not here right now because she's helping take care of the two little nieces right now. So like for example I'm in the middle of the kitchen of her mom's restaurant which is right on the highway so if there's noise coming by from trucks and stuff you'll probably hear that in the background. But this is, um, we're on the Usamacinta River which is, uh, we're actually on the Tabasco side just outside of the state of Chiapas, and it's about a 45-minute drive to Palenque, uh, which is uh, a pretty famous uh, Mayan ruin site. Um, if you go down the river, you'll find the ruins of uh, Yashilan and Bonampak, and eventually you get to Guatemala. Oh. So how did you end up living in Mexico? Um, after Bulgaria, I was in Bulgaria for a few years, um, and then in the middle of 2010, I actually left Bulgaria after two and a half years there, and it was actually on a whim. I asked my sister, you know, where should I go next, and I wasn't travel blogging at the time. I was just doing freelance writing, and my sister recommended Cancun, so I figured I'd come here for three months, go to Cancun for three months, and then I figured I'd just go south from there. Three months turned into six months, turned into a year, turned into two years, turned into three years. Now I've been here four years, and we actually just left um, Playa del Carmen in Cancun in August to come out here for a few months. Um, and then from here, we're going down to Belize for a month to do an on-site mentorship with a hotel. And then from there, I think we're going to go to Mexico City for a few months. But right now, we're still in the middle of negotiating some uh, sponsored travel. But we're definitely going to be in Mexico for the rest of 2015 as well. So, what do you love about Mexico besides your wife? <laughs> That'd be the first thing. Um, mostly, I think for me, when I first got here, I wasn't sure. You know, I didn't, I didn't speak any Spanish when I came down here. Um, no. I, I've, yeah, I have since. You know, I'm reasonably fluent now. Um, I've done over the last year and a half, uh, 13 presentations throughout the Riviera Maya on social media, and it's all been in Spanish. Um, and as as part of learning the language, you get the kids running by right now. That's um, okay. <laughs> as part of the learning the language, you you learn how to become culturally immersed in the country, and I think that that's something that for me opened a lot of doors in the sense that I've been able to see a side of Mexico that most travelers never get to see, and that sort of rubbed off on me. Um, the uh, general friendliness. Um, one of the things I really like where we're at right now, it's pretty rural, but um, the price is the price where I live here in Mexico. So there's no overcharging because I'm a foreigner, whereas when you're in a tourist trap like Cancun or Playa del Carmen, even Palenque, the taxi drivers are always charging you three times as much, and that's just the nature of a tourist trap. But here in, in rural Mexico, in, in backwoods Mexico, the people are very hospitable. The culture is very laid back. If there's one thing that the Mexicans love, it's to party. So I think there are more official holidays, like non-working days in Mexico, than just about any other country in the world, and they will make days up just to take off. Like, tomorrow's the day of the fireman. Let's go drink tequila. Tomorrow's the day of the police officer. Tomorrow's the day of the flowers, you know. So you get lots of uh, – there's always a festival going on somewhere. It's a very laid-back 
bohemian lifestyle in Mexico as compared to a lot of other places. And I think the first thing I always tell people when they come down here is throw away your watch. You're not going to need it. People are going to get there when they get there, and life's going to happen as it happens. You can't stress about it. You just have to learn how to roll with it. Wow. Well, that's an interesting perspective. I've heard that insight shared about Mexico before. I know they love fiestas, but I never got that. <laughs> it can be a little frustrating sometimes when you're trying to do business deals and sign paperwork. Um, but apart from that, I I do appreciate the, the laid-back lifestyle. It's a hell of a lot better than the grind that I had to deal with when I was still living in the States running a construction company. So it's, it's a completely different ball game down here. So where are you from in the States? I was born in Missouri and spent about 15 years there and then 16 actually and then I moved to Colorado and spent from 96 until 2008 in Colorado and then 2008 I left in January of 2008 to go to Bulgaria and I was there for two and a half years traveling around Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean um, before I came to Latin America, and I've been down here since then. Construction company? Uh, I did for um, quite a while, actually. I was in the industry for about 15 years with the family, um, third generation ceramic tile and natural stone contractor. Um, and I did it on my own from 2001 um, until 2008, so about seven years self-employed. And then when the construction industry went under in 2007, that was really the motivation to leave because we went from doing 80000 a year in business to having 32000 in 2007. So I lost $50,000 worth of income, and that just kind of shut me down. And then looking at the books, there was nothing on the books for six months. It was the middle of winter. Um, at the time, I was in, involved with a Bulgarian, and um, she owned an apartment in Bulgaria. So it was like, well, let's sell all our stuff and go off and travel and have fun. So that's what we did. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, construction is a long ways away in my past. I still do piddle fart around the house sometimes, repairs and stuff, but I don't do it for a living anymore. Okay, okay. So tell us, how did you come up with margins for your, for your blogging business? Wow. Um, well, that's actually, a, I'll give you the short version. <laughs> Um, I actually started Marginal Boundaries when I was still living in Bulgaria. It was an actual, it was a science fiction and fantasy. It was a speculative fiction magazine. We did one issue, and then things fell apart in Bulgaria. The relationship ended, um, and I left. And it sat there for about a year and a half or so. And then I was working on contracts in Cancun, and a buddy of mine um, asked me, um, have you ever considered travel blogging? And I said, no, you know, what is this? And then at the same time, I had just gotten a contract to do a Cancun guidebook. And so that got me into looking into this whole location-independent lifestyle, and I found out that there was this whole subgenre, um, this niche market of people who were building these blogs around location-independent living, which was what I had already been doing for the past few years in Bulgaria and traveling around Eastern Europe writing for a living. So... I was able to take that and apply those, basically, those lessons that I had learned from growing up in the freelance writing industry for the, the previous few years and just take that and apply it to creating a travel blog, and then it just went from there. Now, obviously, there was a lot of business behind that. Um, the name actually worked pretty well because when I did it for the SpecFic magazine, it was related to um, fictional boundaries or... or the boundaries that don't exist between worlds in the speculative fic in the speculative fiction industry, but then when I translated over into the travel blogging industry, the name worked as well because what I've always talked about on the blog is that it's one planet, one people. The only maps, the only lines that exist are the maps that governments draw to tell us where we need to pay taxes and to keep us from you know traveling because they want us to spend our tax dollars within the country and not outside of the country. So. When I looked at that and said, well, it works as well for a travel blog because it signifies, you know, imaginary lines or marginal boundaries. So I went ahead and stuck with the name and, and took it from there. Um, so that was, the, that was the name side of things. Interesting, interesting. One world, people, one world. Did that, I mean, that is truly, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's really, you know, that's what I started off blogging about when I first started the blog was, really is immersion travel, so cultural immersion, um, immersing yourself into the culture with the language, the people, 
building friendships, relationships, um, business relationships, um, long-term living. So you know, I lived it you know for a few years in Bulgaria, and then a few years here, and I also went down and spent time in Bogota and Colombia. And those three cities formed the basis of the first three guidebooks that I wrote for the brand. Um, and those guidebooks are how to live like a local in these cities. So, for example, in Cancun, one of the big things we talk about is it's not a travel guide. It's a guide how to live in the city. So we talk about, you know, if you like, for example, discounts. Um, this restaurant has a 30% discount every Tuesday night. The movie theaters are two for one on Wednesday nights. The sushi place has two for one sushi rolls on Thursday nights. Um, this pizza place has discounts on this night. If you want to buy produce, wait to go to the market. Um, wait and go on Tuesdays because Tuesdays everything is on uh, on sale in terms of produce. So instead of paying, say, 30 pesos per kilo of tomatoes, you can go in and get tomatoes for four pesos per kilo. Um, so we actually talk about that on the blog a lot about how you can come down here and save about six thousand dollars a year on your grocery bill as compared to what you would spend in the United States simply by immersing yourself in the culture, learning the language, shopping at the local markets, and using the same places that the locals use to shop as opposed to just going and oh that's where the English you know there's Walmart I'm gonna go to Walmart because I know it and I trust it it's American I'm gonna go to it well you're gonna spend twice as much money as if you would if you actually went and shopped like a local. So that was really what the blog started off and then that got into living in destinations around the world for as little as possible which grew into the expat guidebook which then also talked about income and traveling indefinitely with an online income. Wonderful, wonderful. People who want to get into travel blogging so what advice would to get started. Okay, this is actually I get asked this a lot, um, and I know you had you had mentioned before, uh, you know, about our travel blog boot camps. We can talk about that later, but <clears throat> that the number one piece of advice I can give people is that this is a if you want, there's two different types of blogs. There's the hobby blog, which you can do for fun, and it's something you do in your spare time. And you post photos and stories, and it's just it's just there for your diversion. You have another job paying your bills, and that's just something you do in your spare time. That's one way of doing travel blogging. But the other is if you want to treat it like a business, and that's what we do. We are professional travel bloggers, which means this is a day in, day out, 365 days a year, 15 to 18 hour day job. Um, you, you're always doing this for a living. So the best piece of advice I can give someone is that you can't go from zero to 60 in overnight. It took us about two years before the blog was making a full-time income. And if you talk to most people in the industry who do this for a living, it's going to take two to three years for your blog to get to the point where you're going to be making a full-time income from that blog and the only way you're going to get to that point is by spending 15 to 18 hour days and treating your blog as a business so if you want to do it for a hobby you don't need any money you can start a free blog on a WordPress platform or a blogger platform and that's it but if you want to do this for a business if you want to do it for a living you have to treat it like a restaurant if you were going to build a restaurant you wouldn't just start a business from nothing. You would need twenty to thirty thousand dollars up front to be able to spend on the initial investment of the end of the the restaurant. Um, you would go to a bank and ask for a loan. Um, you would already have three to five years of experience working in the hospitality industry to know how to run the business before you even started it. So I always tell people, whatever you do, just stop. Don't write anything. If you want to do this for a living, take a year, research the people who are doing what it is that you want to do. Talk to them, figure out what they did to get to the level that they're at, and then figure out a business plan. Come up with an actual strategy for a two to three year plan of growth. Then take an appropriate amount of money and invest it in building a professional website. You're going to need money to buy professional equipment in terms of photography equipment. You're going to need money to travel. So that's an investment seed money. You're going to need twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year to travel the world if you're a budget traveler. If you do luxury travel, you're going to need fifty thousand or more a year. Um, 
you're going to have to have all of that money up front, and you're going to have to spend you know, 15 to 18 hours a day building up your reputation and sharing your stories over the course of two to three years before you have a sufficient following, which will then earn you the right to go out there and get sponsored travel from hotels and uh, DMOs, which is the destination market organizations um, around the world, uh, which is the tourist organizations that are bringing people in. Uh, you'll see a lot of bloggers talking about how you know so and so sponsored them to come to a destination for a week. Nobody gets to that point until they've spent two to three years building up their audience, building up the traffic, and investing money in their blog. So if you want to do it as a hobby, do it. It's fun. Do it for free. Build it up. See if you want to do it for a living. But if you actually want to do it for a living, be prepared to invest in it just like you would any other business with time and money. Okay, those are great tips. So um, share with people um, about your your boot camps. Um, our boot camps are. Chris is actually here right now, um, so oh, she's gonna wonderful. come in and, and say hi to everybody. Um, hi, Chris. We can we can move the camera a little bit so we can get both of us. I think maybe. Um, our boot camps started um, in 2013. Uh, we started off doing um, these in Mexico. And we started off doing three months long boot camps, which is where we brought people in, um, brought them into Mexico for three months, and during those three months in time, um, I teach brand basics, brand building classes um, in the evenings, and in the morning she teaches Spanish so that people can learn how to speak the language so that they can get the business opportunities of working in what the World Bank in 2012 called the number one fastest growing digital market in the world, which is Latin America, the Spanish market. So we teach people Spanish as well as the brand building classes so that they can find business opportunities in Espanol, no solo en inglés. So it's, it's a, a two-part thing. Um, then this year we started off, um, we were going to do another boot camp and then she had a surgery in March, so that kind of sidelined us. And then in August, right before TBEX, we did a hybrid version, which is where we did a week-long um, uh, workshop. It was the, the crunch course, the, the, the extracted version. And that's what we're doing now, is we're doing another one of those coming up in January, where it's a week-long workshop that also incorporates an adventure tour. So, like, if you go to our website, you'll see from August, um, we just had a, a another boot camp down here, and we went and saw the ruins of Yachilan, ruins of Bonampak, the waterfalls at Agua Azul, Misolha, the ruins of Palenque, which are considered by some to be the the, the most important ruins in the Mesa pre-American. I forget what it's called, the terminology for that, but it's the where they found the tomb of Pakal, and that's one of the greatest finds that they found in the Mayan Empire. So. It's a, a bit of an adventure and a bit of uh, the, the actual, you know, brand building. We talk about sponsored travel, how to build up the blog, everything else. So the next one's going to be happening in January, January 12th through the 16th. Okay, great. Um, I want to take a, a, a... So can Chris, like, um, get completely sure. in me? Yeah, I think we can. Oh. Chris, let's see here. I think you just opened a capture here. You want to get her completely in the frame, right? Yeah. You, no way. I think we can if we scoot back a little bit. Um, hey, Chris. Chris. <laughs> she's telling me just a minute. Uh, oh, she's okay. telling me just a minute. Okay, okay. She's bringing, she's bringing a chair over now, so we'll, we'll scoot back a little bit, and you should be able to get us both in the screen. Oh, fantastic. Let me know if this works. Okay, there we go. Yay! And then I can turn on the... Um, I need to change real quick. Just give me a second here. Okay. Or I can relay to her because i got the headset on so she can't hear anything here. Oh, I see. No worries. We can continue, and then if you need to ask anything, I'll ask, and she can just answer real quick. That way I don't take up too much time with configuration. Okay. Here. Okay, one, two, three. I'm going to take a photo. Smile. Ms. Devian, if you want to do another one, we can do another one. All right, she's going to take a photo. <laughs> Sonrises. You guys We're see good. it? You can take another one. <laughs> okay. Completo. 
Ah, excelente. <laughs> okay. I was going to try to change the settings here for the audio, but it's... it's let me see here. Okay. All right, that should be better now. Okay. <laughs> it's like candid camera moment. It is, it is. <laughs> oh, I think they're fun. And they have all kind of hats and things you can put on the side, too. Yeah, we were playing around with these at one point on one of our webinars a while back. So. Oh, where are you guys? Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I think it's um, exciting that um, you teach the business of blogging and then she teaches Spanish so people actually learn business Spanish. Um, this is something... Um, can you hear me? We've been... Yeah, I can hear you. Um, this is for us. Um, for me, it was more of a business decision because you know you look at a lot of these workshops. A lot of other people run workshops as well. Um, but it's only focused on the English language market. and the English language market unfortunately is still suffering as far as the global economy goes and a lot of people complain about a lack of work. I can say for one thing with our perspective there has been no lack of work for us and I think a lot of this is just because being able to speak Spanish gives you access to literally a mountain of opportunities because right now you have all these emerging markets in, this, in the Latin world, um, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, um, even Argentina to a lesser degree even though they're having you know financial problems but all of these com countries are growing economically which means um, digital design digital work anything um, the Mexican government released a an income report in 2013 and the top three paid positions in the country were graphic designers for digital websites content writers for digital websites and anybody who freelances online for a living and it's because there's this huge push to build websites, to create blogs, YouTube celebrities. Um, it, it's they're catching up. You know, the American language market, the English language market, had 10, 15 years to have a head start on this stuff. Now it's the Latin market's turn. So there's a huge, huge, huge market down here. That's also why Tbex was just down here in Cancun in September because they're obviously looking to expand into the Latin market and start doing, you know, the North American, the European, a Latin, and then an Asian Tbex. So they're down here taking advantage of the Latin market and the fact that this is this huge growing market right now within Latin America. So it was a business decision for sure on, on our part. Thanks for sharing that. Of course. So aware of those trends. So that I mean, because you're getting all the information in Spanish, so I don't think uh, it's necessarily out there for the rest of us. It's for the gente aquí. Hay muchas oportunidades en el mundo digital, ¿no? Es diferente que en Estados Unidos porque aquí está es creciendo rápido. So yeah, I mean, it's it's and because we're on the ground, it's. There is that benefit of being on the ground. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So, are there any other bloggers like yourself and um, Chris that are doing what you guys are doing in Mexico? Can you say that again? Are there any other bloggers that are doing what you and Chris are doing, Tim, in Mexico? Um, in terms of, um, and I, I just changed the speaker over so that she can hear, so if there's oh, some great. feedback, let me know. Um, the, the market that we're doing right now, um, there are some other bloggers in the Cancun area, which we're no longer in the Cancun area right now. Um, um, Cancun Canuck, Kelly from Cancun Canuck, she's a Canadian who's been down there 11 years. She doesn't do social media so much. She has a really good job with a photography firm, um, but she definitely blogs about life on the ground. There's also... Um, Gringa Nation. Um, she's a, a younger, like mid twenties girl who's got a Mexican husband, and she's blogging about fashion and beach stuff and the Riviera Maya. Um, but I don't think that there's too many who are doing in terms of what we do, um, in terms of the presentations as well as the business side of blogging. Um, Everything I do and what we do with the boot camps and everything else is about brand management, brand consulting, um, apart from the travel blogging. I don't really think that there's too many other people who are doing what we do. Um, 
also, I don't think that there's too many other bloggers who are out um, exploring the places that we explore. Part of our strategy for the the 2015 calendar year is to be here in central Mexico in Tabasco and Chiapas to write about for our blog um, basically write about destinations that don't exist in the English language database for Google so if you go to Google and you type in whatever usually it's gonna bring up a Wikipedia page or somebody's blog or somebody's photos or videos and it's all in English the places we're going and the places that we're visiting um, don't have anything in English. There might be a couple of things in Spanish, but for the most part, it's just um, non-existent. So we're actually looking to fill that void with the blog. Oh, that is a, it's really exciting. So the, um, the positions that you indicated that um, the, I guess the, the government said that are the top ones, the, the graphic artists, the content manager, and what was the other one? Um, anything freelance related to the digital markets. So really anybody who's doing like WordPress design, graphic design, social media management, um, even um, um, I'm trying to think of the other Magento. There's a lot of different website platforms that people are doing, CSS. Um, anything that's related to digital, the digital market, that's the those are the highest paying jobs in Mexico right now. Um, because if you work in a traditional environment, you're related like anybody else in the United States. If you work for someone else in a brick and mortar industry, you're going to be stuck in that minimum wage or that you know equivalent of twelve to fifteen dollars an hour bracket, which is enough to live on, but it's not a excuse me, it's not a lot. So uh, being able to freelance allows people in Mexico to make three, four thousand dollars a month, which in Mexico is the equivalent of making you know seven, eight thousand dollars a month in the United States. So it's a it's a burgeoning market down here. Um, it's, it's growing very quickly, and that's it's really a benefit of, of being able to tap into that is, is beyond what I can really describe in words. Oh, yeah, that, that's a tremendous opportunity. So they want the information to be translated from Spanish to English, or it's Spanish only? So where is it's the opportunity? Usually, it's usually Spanish language based, so... Um, if you can speak Spanish, you can find the work. Um, there isn't a whole lot of um, Spanish to English, but there are. If you, this is where we, especially what I do for a living, is being able to take my expertise from. Yeah, sorry, she had to. We've got our cousin, her little nieces, so she was just making lunch for her little niece. The twelve-year-old was just here, so that'll be in and out while she's here. Um, one of the things I just wrote about in our recent book, it's called Life on the Road, the, 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 the Business of Travel Blogging. And one of the chapters is dedicated to business opportunities as a result of speaking the local language. And that's not always directly related to working in the local language. A lot of the times the expertise that you bring in from your previous work experience in the English language market, because you're 10 or 15 years ahead of where everyone else is here in the Latin world, in these developing countries, this is not just the Latin world, but all developing countries where these digital markets are emerging, um, there's the opportunity to create content in English for the local businesses who have the local language side of their website and then the you know uh, English language version of the website. So here in Mexico, you have a hotel and they've got the English language side and the Spanish language side of things. Now, um, for example, one of the contracts we're working on negotiating right now is for a company out of Mexico City who is a, they're a Mexican City Spanish language based firm, but the company they represent is a British girl um, who is looking to build up a YouTube channel for the English language market. So because I live here locally, um, these are people that I met at TBEX, so I was able to make that business connection with them, and we're working on putting together a package for them right now. It's in English, but it's for a Mexico City company. So there are opportunities to do things in your native tongue. Um, it's just a matter of being able to speak the Spanish to make the connections with the people that are going to get you the opportunities in the first place, if that makes sense. It does. It does. Wow. That's exciting. That is definitely exciting. So a little bit um, more about TBEX. Let, let's explain to, I guess, those who um, are not familiar with who never attended exactly what is TBEX. 
Um, give me one second, Janice. I'm going to turn the speaker back on because I didn't hear you very well that last time, oh, so I need to okay. really change it back. Apologize for this. No. This is what you call technical difficulties <laughs> as a result of... Well, hey, I'm communicating, and it, it hasn't gone away. <laughs> so we're still connected. Okay, estoy caminando así, yo puedo escuchar ahí mejor, perdón. Okay, can you repeat the question? Okay, so, um, to explain TBEX for our viewers who um, are not familiar with what TBEX is. Okay, TBEX is the world's largest travel blogging convention. Um, if you have any interest in being a travel blogger, if you have any interest in travel blogging professionally, you need to be at TBEX because this is where all of the top end bloggers are going to be as well as the industries that you want to be connected to. So for example, if you're wanting to ever have a dream or a hope of getting sponsored by someone, um, you're going to want to be there meeting the heads of, um, just to give you an example, um, this is something that I wrote about in my blog post on, on TBEX um, recently was that being able to sit down and talk with the head of marketing for the Central American and Latin American side of Expedia.com, um, being able to sit down and talk to Pablo for an hour and a half in Spanish, obviously, but also in English. But that's the, the example of the types of people you'll meet. The, the head editor, Paula from Yahoo Travel was there. Um, there's a lot of big name travel editors and, and publishers, the media outlets. Um, this is where you need to go if you want to meet these people so that you can make the personal connections that will lead to the business opportunities that come down the pipeline later on. Because really, when I'm kind of making money as a travel blogger, it's, it, it is very, very often, you know, quality is important, but it's also very important who you know because that personal relationship that you can have with the individual allows you to bridge the gap and, and bring professionalism to the next level. So TBEX is, is, you know, right now there's two a year. They're looking to start having three or four a year. Um, and right now it's, it's just focused on the English language market. That's slowly evolving, but if you blog or are interested in the English language market or the travel blogging industry as a whole, you absolutely need to be tuned into TBEX, not just from what you can learn from the conventions, but also the speed networking and the networking that goes on as a general rule. I've got a 8,800 word blog post up on the blog from, uh, I think about a week ago that I put up talking about all my experience at TBEX and um, obviously my experience was a little bit different than, than some people. Um, we just did an interview for uh, Chris over at One Weird I think it's One Weird Travel or One Weird Globe. I forget the name exactly, but he, that was one of the questions he asked me is, what's the difference between you being at TBEX as a presenter and me being a mere mortal going to TBEX as a normal blogger? And I said, there's really no difference other than the fact that obviously when you're there as a presenter, there's a certain level of, of you know, you've, you've already made it. You've got the badge, you know, your name's on the, on, the, on the schedule. And so the industry leaders tend to give you a little more... Um, respect than they, than they would just their average random travel blogger who's just getting going. Um, they're going to have a bunch of videos coming out um, coming soon, I believe, out on the TBEX website from the convention. So like my presentation and a lot of the other presentations will be available online. But the one that people are really going to want to pay attention to is the final keynote um, where they talked about professionalism and what that means for the new blogger and also what it means coming from the DMO side of things um, and how those two meet in the middle in terms of the professional working relationships between bloggers in the industry. So, yeah, if you have any any professional interest in in getting involved in the travel blogging industry, you need to be going to TBEX, absolutely. Fantastic, fantastic. So I'd like to um, find out, so how, how, what, what are your duties between um, you and Chris for, for your blogging business? Okay, she teaches the Spanish. But on the blog itself, like, um, do you both do photos? Um, she handles the majority of photos is you. Um, I do the bulk of the blogging. Um, in the beginning of 2013, before her surgery, or at the beginning of this year, excuse me, 2014, before her surgery, we had started translating uh, existing blog posts from our stuff in the Riviera Maya over into Spanish. And so I do the rough translations, and then I hand it off to her to do the editing um, like last night, um, the the contract last night, 
um, she edited my, I sent the client in Mexico City, I sent him the English contract and then also a Spanish version of the contract as well. So she handles the final edits on all of my Spanish stuff. But she does handle the bulk of photography. Um, I handle the bulk of the videography, but she also has her own series on YouTube called Viajes con Cristina, which is Travels with Cristina, oh. and that's all in Spanish. So um, she's got, I think we've, I don't know how many episodes we've done. I think it's like 16 or 18 episodes over the last year and a half. Um, we just put up, how many episodes did we do in, in Palenque? Palenque. Palenque, Misahal, and we did three new videos. Yeah. So we did three new videos, like, in August, um, those are the first ones we'd done since around February when she when she was out of commission this summer. Um, but so she does that, and then like I said, she does the photography. But I handle all of the blogging, um, and I handle all of the, the business side of things, the social media strategy. Um, for example, what we're getting ready to go do in Belize next month, I'll be doing all of the training. But while I'm busy in training sessions, she'll be out filming the resort, taking photos of the resort, taking random candid photos of, of animals, plants, sunrise, sunset, uh, lunch, dinner, of me teaching the classes. And then when I do my presentations, she usually is the one recording my presentations. So she helps me on the back end um, with a lot of the, the administrative side of things um, in terms of helping get all that put together professionally. Okay, fantastic. So, um, tell us a little bit about what your day is like. You so the eighteen-hour day. What is this you're doing specifically for eighteen hours in a day? Um, I get up about six every morning, um, and I go to bed about midnight. And it depends on client work because I also do stuff for clients. So, like right now. Um, I have marginal boundaries, but I also have a Spanish um, page that I'm handling. I came on board in May. They had 65,000 followers in May on Facebook. We now have 130,000 followers as of a couple days ago, so I've, I've grown that exponentially over the course of this summer. I helped them develop their first product. Now we're developing three new products for the end of the year. Um, that's a side project. That takes about four hours of my day. Um, that also includes a web comic that I'm doing three times a week. Um, and then I also manage um, an online. We're doing a MMORPG, which is a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. So I've got a team of eight guys that I'm managing right now. We're about seven months into development on that, so I spend about four hours a day on that. Um, and then the rest of the time is with marginal boundaries. And usually in the morning, from about six until ten, I'm answering emails and doing some random social media, publishing whatever new blog posts I have, as well as meeting with my development team for the video game. And then from 10 until 2 or 10 until 1, I've got a personal assistant that I meet up with twice a week. So twice a week, I have a meeting with him on Skype. The days that I'm not meeting with him on Skype, I'm usually doing things like what I'm doing with you right now in that time bracket. I'm doing interviews and Skype calls and Google Hangouts and, and everything else. And in the afternoons, I'll usually take a break, maybe take a nap for a little while, and then I'll come back and I'll do more blog posts, writing, as well as research development, client work, answering more emails, um, ongoing social media management, strategizing, and usually do my research in the evening hours. So when I'm going over data and doing my split testing and checking my paper clicks for the day and making sure that all of the, the ad campaigns are working well, that's usually done in the evening hours. And then, you know, usually around 8 o'clock, I'll finish up around 8 to 10, usually more or less in the 8 to 10 bracket. Sometimes I'll actually push till midnight, but usually around 10 is my cutoff point. Um, and I've also, because of the, we just brought on a new artist with our other game project, so I'm meeting up with him like 8 to 10 at night and going over the next piece of artwork that he's working on. So um, I stay busy. Um, always stay busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, todo el tiempo estamos aquí um, It's, it's, it's uh, you know, and she does because right now she came, for those who don't know, I mean, you guys can read about this in the blog. I don't want to, you know, take up too much time, but in March, um, she had an ectopic pregnancy, and, and we had to have we lost the baby, and so she had a surgery, and that that put her out of commission. So she she's been here um, resting up since March, and just in the beginning of August has felt like she was finally able to start going and doing stuff. So recently she's getting back on her feet. We went and did the three new videos; those are the first ones, and you can even see in the videos like she's going up the up the room up the temples with your your umbrella like a cane. Because she still, you know, still has residual pain from that. But 
she's back on her feet now, so we're going to be getting ready to do what we're doing in Belize. We've got 30 days down there. We're going to be going down and mentoring a resort, um, teaching their head of marketing and their head of blogging for 30 days. Um, we're also going to be doing some fam trips with the Belizean government, um, as well as some other stuff that's for our blog, and she's going to be back doing that. So there's going to be some new Viajes con Cristina episodes. Um, she's going to be handing all the photography while we're down there. Um, so, but that's it's pretty light as far as hiking goes. But um, here she's been doing that and helping with the the kids and the restaurant and her sisters here. So, it's been more family work for her instead of marginal boundaries work. I've kind of you've been resting the last few months. Pretty yeah, much. That's so, good. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, it it certainly sounds like um, being a full time blogger is much more than um, I I guess I've. Of. It's uh, mucho, mucho trabajo. ¿Sí? Es verdad, es mucho trabajo haciendo esto. Un blog. Sí, sí. Yeah, she's giving me the looks. Like, oh, yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it is. It's a lot of work if you want to do this professionally. Um, but that is, you know, I, I, I was talking in a Facebook group recently, and that's one of the topics that came up. And I said, you know, part-time results are the result of part-time efforts. So. The only way to get the full time the full time results is to put in the full time effort. So if you want to do this for a living, um, I put in more hours with my blog than I ever did as a construction worker, and I used to work a lot of hours in construction. Um, the difference is that with this, because there's so many different things you're doing, um, it's never just um, let's go to the beach. It's let's go to the beach and. You know, we're going to take photos, we're going to do video, we're going to go have lunch, but all of that is, you know, if, if we go do that for the day, if we go to the beach for the day, maybe 30% is for the blog and the other 70% is for us. So then we have all those videos and photos for ourselves, but we never just go to the beach. We don't just go on a picnic. We don't just go somewhere because you always have to be thinking about, well, how can I take this and turn it into a story that my readers want to read? How can I turn this into the next story that I can pitch to the media outlets? How can I turn this into um, the next um, story that I can earn a sponsorship with? You know, How can I generate an ROI with this piece of, of, of content. So you always have to be thinking, at least from my perspective, it's always thinking about the business side of things and we don't ever do just anything just for, and that might sound a little boring, but it's, it's not that we don't have fun, but we never just look at something and say, we're going to go do that just for fun. It's, we're going to do that for fun and we're also going to make money out of that. So it's always a business and pleasure mixture. Ah, great point of view. Great point of view. So How much do you think we mix between business and pleasure? <laughs> How much is the combination? Half and half? More or less? It's about half and half. That's what half she's saying. So. <laughs> what she says is okay with me, too. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, so tell me, what, what do you foresee for your, for your future of your blogging? Um, right now... Um, we have a lot of things that we want to do. Um, 2015, we're looking at, as I mentioned, we're going to be going throughout Mexico and exploring places that nobody knows about. Um, we went to the Cascadas de Reformas last year, um, which is not on any English map. It's just it's a partially uncovered series of, of Mayan pyramids out by a river and waterfalls in the middle of nowhere, like an hour and a half from where we live. There's a lot of stuff like that throughout Mexico that we want to go uncover. So that's the that's the 2015 goal. We're actually working on some brand sponsorships. We're working on negotiating a brand ambassadorship right now with a company here in Mexico. If that goes through, we're going to end up doing some content for them throughout 2015. So as far as travel goes, we're going to be staying to Mexico and Central America for the short term. Um, as far as what we're doing business-wise, um, obviously I've got more presentations that I'm doing throughout 2015. I'm doing a five, I believe it's a five-day. We're still negotiating on days. It's a three to five day social media seminar while I'm down in Belize in November. Um, there's going to be two more TBEXs next year. There's the New Media Expo in Las Vegas in April. Um, we're also starting to um, kind of shift the blog away from just travel and lifestyle. Um, I'm doing a big Facebook case study right now. Um, one of the 
that's what I spoke on at Facebook was advanced um, Facebook strategies and marketing. Um, so one of the things that I'm doing right now is putting together a Facebook case study based on some of the campaigns that I'm working on right now, some of the campaigns I've worked on in the past, um, and also the campaign that we're going to be working on while we're down in Belize, and that's going to come out sometime around December. Um, and so these these case studies are things you can't just do them right off the bat. They take three months more or less, three to four months of data gathering to put everything together. Then there's coming up with the associated infographic, which can take two to three weeks to create the infographic. So I'm working on that right now, apart from all the other things I do. That'll launch sometime around December. Um, and then in January, I'm going to be doing a lot more internet marketing and social media content for the blog, along with travel blogging, specifically for the travel blogging industry. We're also, um, we have our boot camp coming up in January. We're also launching a new internship program in January. There's going to be a blog post coming about that on Wednesday, which is tomorrow. Um, we've got six internship opportunities opening up in January for um, people who want to work with us from January to June. We just did a year-long mentorship with Devlin from DevlinMaddenPurdue.com. He was with us from June of 2013 to August of 2014. So I'm a big fan of doing mentorships and um, internships, not just the boot camps. So we're giving people the opportunity, if you can pay for it, then obviously you can come and pay for the time and the experience and have fun on the adventure tours. But there's also a certain amount of people who would love to learn how to do this, but they don't necessarily have you know, 3000 or $10,000 to spend on a big boot camp. So how can they get the experience? And I have no problems letting people work for that. So um, we're going to be doing that in, in 2015 as well. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of different irons in the fire, and then we'll do more boot camps in the future, and and so on and so forth. So that's kind of the short short term 2015 goals. Okay. Okay. So. Um, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so um, for for travelers, just general who are looking to come to Mexico and they want to go beyond Cancun. Um, what recommendations you give them for planning uh, a trip? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask her in <laughs> Spanish too because she doesn't have the headset on, so she's just kind of listening slightly, but it's not as loud. Okay. Um, ¿Qué tipo de recomendaciones pueden hacer por, podemos hacer para gente que quieren visitar México? First time visitors, like first time visitors, or people or, who or just general travelers who just want to come to Mexico, but they want to go beyond Cancun. Uh, yeah, she was saying that's that's a big thing is too. It depends on where they want to go. Like, what state do they want to travel to? Because obviously, Mexico has. Let me just put it this way: Mexico is absolutely safe. It is one of the safest countries in the world. Just as the United States has problems with cities like Chicago having a very bad murder rate, Mexico yeah. has places that are kind of dangerous. So. Juarez, obviously you don't want to be in Juarez, and Michoacan is having problems with the, the cartels. But I would say 80% de Mexico is seguro. Mm -hmm. Like 80% of Mexico is completely safe to travel to, um, absolutely safe to travel to. You do not need to worry about being a foreigner in Mexico. The people are very hospitable. Nothing bad will happen to you. Um, but it does depend on what state you want to go to because there's so much to see here. So if you like the beach... You're going to want to do the Riviera Maya or Puerto Vallarta or Cabo San Lucas, which are consequently going to be priced towards you know, tourist prices. Um, if you want to do the natural side of things, you want to see the forests and the, the biospheres, the canyons, the mountains, Chiapas. Come see us in Chiapas because there is so much to see here in terms of natural beauty. There's the biospheres, the national parks, there's canyons, rivers, mountains, um, Mayan villages. Um, Tabasco has um, Las Parques de, de Ventas. Um, Yunca. Yunca Ventas. There's national parks that nobody goes to because it's there's no tourism industry here. So if you like to backpack and see things that are off the beaten path, there's a lot of things you can do and see. And then if you're a big fan of culture, um, Mexico City is a it's in the top five cities of the world. It's like New York City in terms of size, economic power, um, culture, things to do, opera, theater, concerts. Um, you've got Mayan ruins, Aztec ruins. I mean, there's all these ruins outside of Mexico City. You've got places like Puebla, San Luis Potosi, 
I could go on. I mean, there's just so much things. So really, you, you would need to, to, to determine what do you want to see? What do you want to experience? Because there is so much diversity in terms of um, the geological side of things. Um, you can see anything you want to see. So if you like the beaches, you can go to the coast. But if you want to see the mountains, you're going to want to go to the interior. Or if you want to go see, you know, what we're planning on doing for December, for example, we're, we're planning on being in Mexico City for all of December because we want to be there to cover on the blog the festivals of Navidad and also for the New Year's because what better place to celebrate Christmas and to cover all of the markets and the festivals and the celebrations that go on for Christmas than in Mexico City. So it just kind of depends on what you want to see. Um, pretty much everywhere you go, you can speak English as long as you're in a city and you're going to find people that can that can understand English. Um, everything is safe. Um, obviously, if you can, make local connections before you get there. Do so so that you can find out the actual prices for taxis um, and public transportation. Um, and because there is a gringo tax, um, the other thing you need to be aware of is everything here can be negotiated, but you have to be willing to negotiate intelligently because nothing in Mexico, nunca es medio. Like you can't just go in and say, I want that for half price and think that they're going to give it to you for half price because they don't ever mark anything up that much. I just actually did an interview with Tim Leffel from uh, the Cheapest Destinations blog while we were in TBEX, and it's up on his site now. Um, and that's one of the things that came up in the discussion was you know, negotiation in Mexico, and it's the fact that they don't ever mark things up that much. It might be marked up 15 to 25 percent, um, so you can't just ask for half off because it's never going to happen, and it's very rude of you to think that you can. So knowing how to negotiate everything, any lawyer you talk to in Mexico is going to tell you, hay muchas vueltas. There are many turns, there are many paths you can take in Mexico as far as business goes. So um, if you're willing to negotiate, you can get a cheaper deal on everything. Um, so if you want to come down here and buy clothing, souvenirs, stuff like that, it's a great place to do it. Other than that, enjoy the culture. Everything in Mexico is a fiesta. So as long as you're willing to throw away your watch and have fun, you will have fun in Mexico no matter what part you go to. Okay. Well, thank you so much. The, uh, <laughs> Christina, what, I want to add anything before Andy we sign said, off? ¿Tú quieres añadir algo? En el tema de cosas pueden hacer en México o recomendaciones para visitando aquí. Pero depende de qué lugar. No, no, just in general por turistas. Por los turistas. Yeah, it's it's that's the that's a big thing. Um, I didn't really. I kind of touched on it a little bit, but like she's saying, um, I don't know if your audience can hear her or speak Spanish. So I'll just, I'll just say it in English. Um, the culture in Mexico is is such that every pueblo and every state has a different culture, and they also have different natives. There's different indigenous people that live in every single state. So you've got the Mayans, the the Aztecs and the descendants, Azteca, the Aztecas, que tipos de Almecas, Almecas, Toltecas. Toltecas. There's literally hundreds of different natives that live throughout Mexico and they still have a very direct cultural impact on what you're going to see in the cities as far as celebrations go. So every week, usually every week there's a different parade or festival going on in the Zocolo or the city center, um, there's always something going on on the weekends, and it's usually going to be related to some type of cultural aspect of what's going on within the Pueblo, the surrounding communities, and the state, and all the indigenous people that make up that state. Because Mexicans are not Mexican per se. Mexicans are a mixture of many different indigenous tribes along with the Spaniards who came here. So every generation has has taken some of the cultural aspects and evolved them so uh, if you like culture and history Mexico is a great place to be and the food the food of Mexico yeah every state every state has a different different type of food a lot of that's the thing in the and she's saying in the Yucatan that sometimes the people, if they're not accustomed to the food, they won't like it. And there's also people, a lot of people have heard of Montezuma's Revenge. 
um, and that's not necessarily re it's not bad food. It's just your your gut is not accustomed to the type of food that you're eating, and so you're like, oh my god, I'm dying. And in reality, your body's just going, this is completely different than anything I'm. You know, most Americans are used to eating processed food. Mm -hmm. So when you come down to a place like Mexico, and everything you're eating has been pre prepared by hand from natural ingredients, and it's it's got there's no way around it. There is bacteria and not the bad kind of bacteria. It's like the bacteria in yogurt, the probiotics. You've got mm -hmm. there's things in yogurt, you know, that are alive. It's live cultures. And so there's a lot of stuff that's in Mexico as far as the local foods go. They're incredible foods, but sometimes it can take your body a little bit to used to. I have never had problems, um, but I do have an iron stomach. Um, and I've eaten I've eaten turtle, I've eaten iguana, I've eaten a lot of different things in Mexico, and I've never gotten sick. It's just um, you have to be adventurous about it. But there's amazing, an amazing amount of diversity in the food down here. So, I'm glad that, um, that you both addressed the Montezuma's Revenge, um, uh, I guess the American I stereotype a, for yeah. Mexico, unfortunately. But yeah, I, I, it's just cleansing because if you it is. Country. It's cleansing. Yes, your body cleanses. Yeah, changing diets. So that's that's natural. It happens. Trap. Just. A part It'll of the happen trap. anywhere you go. New food, yeah. new place. You might get sick. You might not. It's just it's going to happen. It's mm -hmm. not bad food, and it's not that the people are preparing, you know, low quality, inferior, dirty yeah. food. It's just it's different cultures. So. It's, I'm, I'm glad that you appreciate that side of the fence. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do. Well, I'm going to let you two get on with your day. Sure. Thank you so much for taking time out. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> nosotros, uh, we're, you know, it's something that um, we're always happy to talk to people. Um, I know Chris is finally feeling better enough to get on in front of the camera now, so um, this I'm has glad. been a pleasure for us. Um, and any, if you need anything else from us in the future, let us know. We're always happy to come talk. So, definitely, no definitely. Yes, well, uh, we'll do it just from travel and social media angle next time. So, but thank you so much. Can you say that again? Sorry, it was fake. I said next time maybe we'll do the travel and angle. Have a sure, absolutely. Okay. And hopefully by that point we'll be in a better place with better internet connection and no noise in the background. So, I so. The, because it's noisy here. To <laughs> <laughs> the flavor, it's authentic. <laughs> yeah, it's the local pueblo. So, all right. Well, thanks, Janice, for your time. For your time. Thank Mixing you. up my Spanglish here. So that's okay. Thanks. All right. All right. <laughs> we'll see you, you next time. Bye. Bye bye. Bye, Christine.